Both the University of Kentucky and the University of Minnesota are land-grant institutions formed by the Morrill Act. We serve as our state's land-grant universities, providing the full breadth of education, research, and community engagement. We also have strong, comprehensive academic medical centers and large university hospitals that serve the community. In both cases, our research and scholarly endeavors offer the brightest hope for transformation and change for the broader world that we serve. I'd like to thank University of Minnesota President Eric Kaler for joining us today for this conversation. And I look forward to hearing from the insights from both presidents about we can learn, what we can learn from each other to build upon our efforts and partner together with our communities for the good of all. To start that conversation, please join me in welcoming University of Kentucky President Eli Capilouto. Thank you, Tim, and good morning to everyone. It's a delight to be on one of these trips again, and it's a pleasure to be in such a thriving metropolis as Tim has described, and a university known for being so highly globalized, entrepreneurial, and innovation-based, and a heart of an economy. And it's even more rewarding to be welcomed so graciously to this campus, a place that's noted around the country for its transformational approaches to education, research, service, healthcare. And much of this you can credit to the stewardship of President Eric Kaler. Now I know if you look at the bios in uh, speakers, you've noted that Dr. Kaler has his PhD in chemical engineering from his alma mater here. He's a foremost expert in complex fluids, which has application in drug manufacturing, food processing, drug delivery, and that he uh, has been recognized for his incredible scholarship and service through uh, induction into the Academy of Arts and Sciences. But I find the most telling traits of a great leader are how they respond when things go wrong. And Dr. Kaler certainly had one of those events in the past year that made national news. He was faced with a crushing, crushing situation on campus that involved things that are certainly topical and volatile, and that can be athletics and sexual assault. He faced increased scrutiny as he declared in an unflinching tone that the university would uphold its values. He fa faced incredible pressure from all sides, media, alumni, other stakeholders here and elsewhere. He faced significant financial pressure, frustration, and cries of concern across the University of Minnesota fan base as the situation details came to light. But through all of this, and as public opinion fluctuated, he never, ever wavered. He stayed true to the enduring principles, principles that clearly prevailed in the end. He sets an admirable example for all of us on these types of issues and how to lead in difficult times. And he leads on a variety of other issues that our country's higher education institutions face. I have the pleasure of sitting on the NCA Board of Directors and Board of Governors with President Kaler, and because of his principles, his eloquence, his integrity, he's one of those people that when he speaks, and believe me, university presidents that serve on that exercise their First Amendment rights to the fullest, but when he speaks using an economy of words, people listen, and that's a tribute to him. So I am honored to join him for the session today. I want to welcome him to the stage. I know, too, that this is a week that he's preparing for his Board of Trustees meetings. I spent five hours with my board yesterday. It's great. <laughs> the day after, it's even better. But anyway, so we thank him for taking time from his busy schedule to be with us today. President Kaler.
Thank you, Eli, for that very kind and gracious uh, introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the University of Minnesota. Welcome to the state of Minnesota. Minnesota. Uh, welcome uh, to the Twin uh, Cities. Mayor Gray, it's an honor to have you here, joined by uh, members uh, of your city uh, council. Uh, as was mentioned, uh, we do call this uh, the U. And uh, I did earn my PhD here uh, sometime in the last century. And uh, I went to take my first job at the University of Washington in Seattle. And uh, early on, somebody asked me <coughs> where I worked. And I said, well, I work at the U. And she looked at me with a puzzled expression and said, well, which one? <laughs> well, there are 15 or more higher education institutions in the Twin Cities, but this is the U. And we're very happy uh, to have you here today. Uh, you've got uh, three busy days uh, ahead of you, I understand, and uh, the agenda demonstrates the, uh, the strong uh, partnership that keeps your community uh, special, uh, vital, uh, and prosperous. Uh, I know that Eli and I are going to be talking about our research uh, enterprise, our tech transfer uh, operations, and uh, I'm glad that uh, Jay Strankler, the head of our Office of Technology Commercialization, uh, will uh, be able uh, to visit with you as well. Uh, you will also meet R.T. Ryback, the former mayor uh, of Minneapolis. Uh, he is an inspirational uh, leader. Uh, we have our challenges in Minnesota, and among them is the wide disparity in achievement uh, between students of color and white students, between low-income kids and students of means. And R.T. was the, also the executive director of Generation Next, a coalition uh, of organizations in the Twin Cities that I co-chaired for five years uh, that really is leaning into this problem of inequity uh, and opportunity gaps. And so I hope you'll get a chance to talk about that uh, with him. Uh, you'll also find out that we are one of the leading uh, communities in the country in regards to our vibrant uh, arts and cultural uh, activities, and uh, I hope you get a chance to, to taste that uh, a little bit. Uh, if you have some spare time, uh, you can walk around our campus uh, a little bit in the abundant daylight that has, uh, that has been already uh, mentioned. Uh, you can visit our Biomedical Discovery District, which is a group of five or six buildings just to the other side of the football stadium, which is state-of-the-art uh, biomedical uh, research uh, space housing. Uh, many researchers working on a wide variety of, uh, of ailments. Uh, or you can walk over to Williams uh, Arena, uh, a basketball arena just uh, across University Avenue. Uh, it has a raised basketball floor, which uh, is a fearsome thing to our opponents for the first uh, time or two they play on it. It is a classic home court advantage. Uh, and of course, we also have a coach named Patino. So if you're missing yours, you can visit with ours. Uh, and if you want to see something uh, else, you can, uh, you can uh, take a four block uh, walk to the west, and you'll see Kaufman Union, you'll see the Wiseman Art Museum, uh, which is uh, one of the first Frank Gehry buildings in his uh, wavy metal uh, design. We call it a baby bell bow. Uh, it's quite an interesting piece of, of architecture, and the art inside uh, is quite uh, interesting. And from uh, there, you can see the skyline of Minneapolis. Uh, the state of Minnesota is home to 17 Fortune 500 companies. A good number of them are headquartered uh, in Minneapolis. And that vibrant uh, business and corporate community is a huge asset uh, to the university, both in terms of providing opportunities for our graduates, uh, but also providing uh, working professionals to come be mentors uh, or guest lecturers in our classrooms and, and laboratories. Uh, I think I'll stop there. Uh, we'll get into conversation. I should not forget to mention our sister city of St. Paul, which is uh, behind me. If you hop on the green line, uh, you can be in downtown uh, St. Paul uh, in just a few minutes. And it's quite interesting to have twin cities, uh, but really quite different cultures. There's a different vibe in downtown St. Paul than there is in downtown uh, Minneapolis. And in this community, uh, there are very often people who are Minneapolis people or they're St. Paul people, and they sometimes don't talk very much together. So welcome to the Twin Cities. Uh, I'm looking forward to our conversation. I hope you have just a wonderful conference and time with us. Thank you. And normally when I'm on a stool like this, I'm having a martini, Eli, so. <laughs> So as part of this, I'll, I'll uh, maybe I'll be Charlie Rose or, or something, but uh, each president has developed a set of questions that they want to ask each other. And so I'm going to uh, ask President Capilouto to start and uh, begin with a question for President Kaler. Sure. 
uh, as you described, uh, your interface with uh, the cities that surround you. You have, uh, and you're right across the river. You have a major university in the downtown core. It presents many challenges and many opportunities for both community and the institution. And uh, like you, we want to grow. And what are some of the challenges that you face living next door to the city center? How do you interact with city planners? How do you make your, your plans in harmony with uh, the city? Well, uh, there are really two areas of, of intersection that, uh, that we work on. One is housing, uh, obviously, and the other is public safety, which, uh, which goes uh, together. Um, you haven't had a chance to, to look at the geography yet, but um, to the east of us is a neighborhood called Marcy Homes. And uh, Marcy Homes uh, was one of the, the classic examples uh, in, the, in the late 1950s uh, when the freeway, 35W, went through that neighborhood, bifurcated it, and uh, really um, caused the decline, ultimately, uh, of that neighborhood as a place where, where single-family homes would be and, and uh, elementary schools would be and people would, would have lives and, and, uh, uh, and live there for a long time. Uh, and particularly on this side of the freeway, uh, that neighborhood has turned into almost exclusively uh, rental housing. Uh, it turns out that the city of Minneapolis has to grant you a permit as a landlord to, uh, to transfer from single family to, uh, uh, to, uh, to renters, and, and they've given away those freely. And I think there, if there is uh, more than two or three single family homes in that part of the neighborhood, I'd be surprised. Uh, and that creates an interesting um, dynamic, obviously, student rentals, uh, a lot of turnover, uh, a lot of late night activity uh, in the streets, uh, opportunity for opportunistic crime, uh, and we work hard with the city to, to regulate uh, those, those uh, uh, rental properties and to provide, together with our police department, uh, coverage uh, of, that, uh, of that neighborhood. Uh, the interesting dynamic subsequently uh, is you cannot help but see uh, a large number of high-rise uh, apartment buildings uh, uh, around our neighborhood. All of them look new because pretty much all of them are new within the past uh, four years or less. Uh, 7,000 uh, beds have come online in those apartment buildings and they're permitted uh, for 7,000 more beds in upcoming apartment buildings. That creates an opportunity for students who want to live in that kind of of place, and these are very nice apartments. I'm sure you have them around your school too. Granite countertops, views of downtown. I was 42 years old before I had a granite countertop. It's a, it's a, it's a lifestyle to which they will need to aspire again. Uh, but that creates an opportunity for students to live there, but it leaves the housing stock over here in Marcy Homes uh, that was home to, to not very well off students and now is just home to not very well off people. And so we worry about the changing dynamic there, keeping that a vital neighborhood, partnering with the city in terms of providing opportunities to repopulate that with, with single family homes and create that space. So it really is an issue of land use, building use, uh, and public safety uh, in, in that neighborhood. We have a large uh, Somali population uh, in uh, the Cedar Riverside area just across the street adjacent to our waste, uh, West Bank. Uh, that creates interesting cultural opportunities and chances for, uh, for misunderstandings as well as, as collaboration. So uh, really interacting with the city is around those housing uh, and public safety issues. Well, we feel at the University of Kentucky our, our fate uh, is intertwined with our city. And part of that is our economic vitality. Could you talk about uh, your economic impact in this region and what it means? Sure. So the, um, the easy answer uh, is we've done an economic impact study. It's a little bit old, but uh, we identified a return of $13.20 uh, for every dollar that the state uh, puts into the into the university, we think that's a pretty good investment uh, for the state uh, of uh, of Minnesota, uh, and it really is, of course, beyond that. Uh, we are, uh, in a real sense, uh, the hub uh, 
of the Twin Cities area uh, and of, uh, uh, of the state. We are older than the state of Minnesota. We were chartered five years before Minnesota became a state. Uh, that gives us constitutional autonomy uh, in terms of governance. Uh, so the state uh, can't tell us what to do legislatively. Uh, they can decide not to give us any money. So uh, there is a, there's a certain uh, emptiness to uh, autonomy without, uh, without resources. Uh, but it's a, uh, a critically important part of the culture and history uh, of the state. Uh, we graduate about 15,000 uh, individuals who go to work, uh, many of them in downtown Minneapolis uh, or downtown St. Paul. Uh, a research uh, university like ours uh, is vital to the technology companies uh, that are here. Um, the CEO of General Mills told me recently that we are the place where they go for talent. Uh, there are over 10,000 University of Minnesota alumni at, uh, at Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing. Uh, it's uh, a really important reason that Fortune 500 companies locate here, and they drive the economy uh, of, the, of the region and the state. Well, you mentioned uh, those Fortune 500 companies. That they're among the group that uh, has been sustained over time. If you look at those lists, from 40, 50 years ago. There's some names that are no longer there, and they're populated by uh, new entrepreneurs. You talk about your Office of Commercialization here. Talk about the, how you nurture the birth of those new companies that uh, could be those Fortune 500 companies that rapidly develop nowadays. Yeah. So uh, we use a very, um, well thought out uh, stage gate process to evaluate ideas and move them through to, uh, to companies. We've created over 100 uh, startup companies. Uh, last year, the White House invited uh, 35 startup companies from around the country uh, to come and, uh, and celebrate the, their, their success and their, their uh, uh, being role models for, for moving technology forward. Two of those 35 companies were from the University of, of Minnesota. Uh, so it's a, a careful engagement with uh, external advisors uh, that have technology expertise uh, that enable uh, our folks to really critically evaluate uh, the technology and the potential for success. You know, the name of the game in this business is to fail fast. If you're going to fail, you want to do it quickly. You don't want to. You don't want to drag this out and waste and waste uh, resources. Uh, so we're careful. We're hard nosed about it. We we use external uh, people to evaluate. There's no home field advantage. But at the same at the same time, uh, we've created a venture fund that enables us to partner uh, to match up to, I think, $350,000 uh, initial seed capital, uh, really for proof of concept, to do the experiments to let you get the second patent, to do the experiments to let you prove an idea, uh, and those then enable us to put companies on firm, um, on firm grounding. One other thing that I will mention about this is that we also uh, are home to what's known as the Minnesota Cup. Uh, this is run through the Carlson School of Management, uh, and it's a competition uh, for, uh, for startup companies. At the end of the day, uh, they get recognition and they get access to, uh, to capital. And we had over 1,500 uh, entrants in that, uh, that competition last year. I believe it's the largest uh, statewide um, entrepreneurial competition uh, in the country. So it's a, a history and a culture of promoting these ideas. Uh, we, we've worked hard, you know, a little inside baseball in, in terms of our tenure code. Uh, tenure is awarded to faculty based on, on scholarly work, and we've expanded that definition uh, to allow the development of intellectual property to be recognized as a, as a part of that tenure package as well. Uh, do you have any, any of examples of uh, those companies that succeeded fast? And maybe some of those that failed fast? Uh, the failures, we tend to not to, uh, kind of remember those yeah, very well. Uh, so. uh, it's a little bit like as a faculty member, you know, former students contact you and, and tell you how you helped them and got them to be better, et cetera. And you, make, you feel good about that as a faculty member. You know, the kid whose life you screwed up, they generally don't stay in touch, <laughs> and that's a little bit, a little bit true of our, of our companies, uh, too. Uh, we have... Um, Probably uh, an easy one to, uh, to, to, uh, to talk about is, is uh, Snapgrid. And what it is is a social media platform that was developed uh, in the College of Education and Human Development, not in science and technology. Uh, and it enables a, a faculty member to, to post a question on, on the app, and then the students uh, record a, a quick video of the response, and then they can assemble those videos and, and begin to have that, that uh, dialogue. It's a way that 
he, he said he, he got the idea because he's talking to a, a group like this and, and he's not sure everybody's paying attention. And so now this way he can send it and they're on their app and respond back to it. And that's, that's growing quite, uh, quite nicely. So interesting example. Uh, I'll have to segue to a, another question. Um, given a generation that will, would find uh, such an app quite appealing, and that's the generation we're educating now. Uh, as a university president, um, how do you move an institution to best accommodate a new learning style that you uh, are seeing in this generation? That is a really interesting question. Um, you know, the facile answer is you hire younger faculty, but you can't always, uh, you can't always do that. Uh, we provide a lot of resources uh, in, in conjunction between our provost office and uh, Office of Information Technology uh, that provides uh, training and opportunity and structure for faculty who may not be as facile with, with modern technology or with, with online uh, activities. Uh, we use a learning uh, management model. We're moving from something called Moodle to something called Canvas. Uh, so we try to create structure where all faculty can do that. But obviously, um, you and I are going to be more comfortable, perhaps, with a more traditional kind of kind of discussion. Uh, one thing that the faculty of all generations uh, are embracing pretty well here, and we're building infrastructure to accommodate this, is an active learning environment where we'll assign a student to listen to a lecture you know, at their convenience and then come with that knowledge to the classroom, work in small groups, facilitated and coached by the teaching assistant, the faculty member, to solve those problems and work with each other. So it's a, a little bit of a flipped classroom uh, model and we, we're investing heavily in that, in that kind of classroom space so that we can do those things. Excellent. Uh, I've heard, this is my first trip here, about your Medical Alley Association and Explain that to the group and the impact that it's had. So uh, Medical Alley is a, an association of uh, medical device and, and uh, uh, therapeutic uh, companies in, uh, in the Twin Cities area. Uh, you can think of it, I think, a little bit as, as uh, something of a trade association, but it's a, uh, an organization that advances the, um, uh, the message uh, around that, uh, that field, that, that, that uh, um, technology and that business. Uh, the University of Minnesota takes claim as uh, the home of the medical device industry. The uh, artificial pacemaker was invented here by Earl Bakken, went on to, to become the foundation of, uh, of Medtronic. Uh, Boston Scientific and St. Jude are also here, so uh, we, uh, we are uh, very much the home uh, center uh, of, the, uh, of the medical device um, industry. Just as, a, as an aside, uh, Earl Bakken was a tinkerer. And he saw in uh, Popular Mechanics uh, a description in the 50s of how to make an electronic metronome, talk, tick, talk, tick, talk. And he said, you know what? I bet I could use that technology to stimulate a heart to beat. And he did. And uh, created a, a, a prototype and uh, left it in the laboratory. And, and uh, somebody came back and looked for it. And he said, oh, it's implanted in that animal over there already. So this was a little looser uh, pre-FDA regulation yeah. so you could test these ideas more, more quickly. So you've talked about some of the new startups, some of the more established uh, companies that you're blessed to have in your neighborhood. How do you uh, interface with those larger, more established companies? You talked about certainly the talent you're able to provide uh, through your graduates. But what other kinds of relationships, partnerships do you develop? A lot of opportunities really from, from top to bottom. Um, we uh, have a, a University of Minnesota Foundation and uh, a good number of the uh, local uh, CEOs or, or number twos are, are on that board, so we have that kind of, of connection. Uh, all of our colleges have advisory boards that bring in uh, folks from um, uh, alumni or, or, or friends uh, from those companies as well as around the country, but, but a lot of them locally to provide a guide, advice and, uh, and conversation. Um, we use uh, uh, business folks to come and be adjunct faculty members, uh, lecturing, uh, mentoring our students. Uh, we try to have a lot of, of connection that way. Uh, and we also have a lot of connection in the technology uh, space. So we have a, an organization called iPrime, 
which is an acronym for something that I'm not going to remember for you right now. Uh, it's a consortium of about 40, 45 companies that uh, have access to university laboratories and, and expertise on, a, on an episodic uh, basis. Um, really as open as possible to, uh, to collaboration. One of the, the best things we have that benefits uh, not only local companies, but also uh, companies who want to partner with us from, from anywhere in the world, uh, is something that we call uh, Minnesota Intellectual Property, or MIN IP. Um, it used to be the case, and, and I don't know if it is in, in Kentucky, where uh, if you uh, wanted to interact with a company, faculty member would have an idea, a company colleague would think that was a good idea relevant to, to a problem that they were working on or a product they were developing, and he'd get approval from his boss to, uh, to, to fund that um, um, operation. And then we would bring uh, in the intellectual property lawyers, sometimes a problem. Uh, because what would happen is a protracted negotiation about what the royalty stream would be if an invention came, if there was a discovery, if that was a patentable discovery, if that patent was, uh, was issued, if that patent was reduced to practice in a device that was sold for a profit, how much of that profit would the university get? So you wound up spending a lot of time arguing about a pretty hypothetical thing. And sometimes companies would walk away, and so our faculty member would wind up only 100% of nothing, which was not a very good deal. So to make a long story short, we've eliminated that. We allow a company uh, to pay uh, either 10% uh, or, or a fixed amount of uh, $25,000 uh, or 10% of the contract, and you get basically uh, an upfront royalty-free license to the intellectual property. Uh, and that has exploded. Uh, we've signed uh, about 350 of those uh, agreements with about 175 companies. Uh, and it just lowers the barrier. So now rather than a transaction, you're having a partnership. You now are, are sharing in, in the development. Faculty members can go back and forth to the company. Students have opportunities for internships. It's just a win-win. Um, we looked historically, the amount of royalty we've gotten from those kind of contracts is really uh, low, and we feel that the partnership with industry really has, has enormous benefits beyond what might be a little bit of revenue. I'm going to shift a little in, in a more global sense, uh, ask you to speak as a seasoned and respective university president on uh, what you see on the horizon in, in terms of some of the policy debates ongoing, the uh, proposed budgets at the federal level, and what kind of impact do you think that could have on universities across the country, and yours being such a uh, thriving research enterprise? Well, I, I think you have to look at uh, the proposals that the President has brought forward for funding of the NIH, the uh, Department of Energy, and the National Science Foundation uh, with a great deal of concern. The proposal is to uh, reduce the NIH budget by 22 percent, the NIH, uh, the NIH budget by 22 percent, NSF I believe is an 11 percent reduction, DOE a 17 percent reduction. Uh, those would be absolutely catastrophic. Uh, it's, it's inconceivable to me that Congress will not recognize the core role that federally funded basic research has played in the creation, um, quite frankly, of the world as we know it today, not just our own economy, uh, whether it's the internet, whether it's fundamental biomedical discoveries that, that have led to devices and disease prevention, um, whether it's, it's uh, energy uh, advances that have reduced uh, our, our dependence on, on uh, resources we don't control ourselves. Uh, it's just incomprehensible to me that those will, will pass. And, and uh, at least in the Senate, uh, the conversation is that that budget is, is dead on arrival. Um, Congress has, has traditionally invested uh, heavily uh, in, uh, in uh, NIH research. Um, disease advocates make a pretty compelling case for that, uh, for that investment. Uh, so I don't think that'll happen. I think the, the worry is that just being able to have that conversation of let's reduce the NIH budget by 22% by is, is, is frightening, frankly. And it would be devastating to the, uh, uh, to the academic research enterprise across the, across the country. So uh, we have to hope that that doesn't happen. And of course, we will be lobbying uh, for uh, that fundamental research uh, funding aggressively. There are other um, 
cuts uh, that, are, that are called for that are a little bit inside baseball, but put simply, uh, every federal research grant we get carries with it some additional money for so-called indirect costs, which enable the universities to keep, keep the lights on, keep the buildings clean, uh, follow the regulatory uh, rules necessary for uh, the, the legal and, and compliant care execution of that research. The proposals have been to reduce that amount of money, which will just shift that cost to somewhere else. Um, you know, you can't kind of hope cost goes away. It, it, hope is not a real good plan in general, and it's not a good plan in, in this space. And so that just is going to increase the cost of our institutions uh, to carry out research, which will again indirectly limit what we can do. And you know, I believe pretty passionately that, that uh, fundamental basic research is a really good thing uh, for the United States and something that we should be investing in. Uh, I agree, and, and I'm encouraged by certainly Senator McConnell and, and others in our delegation about the budget being dead on arrival. The, the overhead to, to fund those essential activities to conduct this research at our institution for NIH proposals, uh, that is 50%. So for every dollar you get for that project, basically, you get 50 cents in overhead. And I will till, still tell you that we have to subsidize research sure, we in our should. place. And so if you were to lose that 50% or have it reduced considerably, uh, I, I think it would cripple our research prowess at the University of Kentucky. And, and again, you know, you look at that fundamental research as the beginning of a pipeline uh, to these startup companies. I mean, the, the, the function of business in this space is to take those, those research advances and turn it to practical uh, products or, or, or treatments that, that help people. And, you know, you really, I, as I said, I, it's inconceivable to me that that will, will move through, uh, through Congress. A very, very dangerous proposal. Tell us about your state funding and how that uh, changed over time. Well, uh, and I have the same question for you. Uh, we uh, peaked as most higher education, public higher education institutions did in 2008. Uh, our state appropriation dropped 22% uh, from, uh, from 08 to uh, 11. Um, and that caused uh, us to uh, increase uh, tuition uh, markedly, uh, which is uh, not something anybody wants to do. Uh, but uh, you can't really cope with that dramatic a change in state funding with any other uh, mechanism. You can only shrink or cut so fast. Uh, during that period, the amount of money we received from tuition in aggregate uh, surpassed the amount of money that we, we received from, uh, from the state. Uh, so right now, uh, we get about $600 million a year uh, from, uh, from the state of Minnesota, uh, $1.2 billion in the biennium, and uh, about, we generate about $950 million in tuition revenue. Since 2008, uh, since 2011, uh, the state funding has gradually uh, increased. Um, in the 20, we have a biennial budget um, structure in Minnesota, so in the 2013 to 15 biennium, uh, we received uh, an increase in state of funding that was sufficient enough to allow me to freeze Minnesota resident uh, tuition for undergraduates for two years. So we were able to bend the cost curve uh, on, uh, on tuition. Uh, I'm very glad to say in the six years I've been president, uh, tuition has on average risen uh, right at 1% per year. So we have, we have bent that curve. We've, we've done a lot of things to control costs and, and uh, increase other uh, revenue. Uh, but the state appropriation is, is uh, coming back, but we're still hundreds of millions of dollars. More than that, if you account for inflation from where we were in our peak in 2008. And I suspect you have a similar story. Oh, we, we have to stretch a dollar even uh, further. Yes. Uh, we, we get uh, $267 million in state funding. About $80 million of that uh, really is a pass-through. It goes out to mandated programs like our extension offices in 120 counties. Uh, we have a similar story that over time you would uh, notice that uh, two-thirds of our budget, it's largely for our our teaching enterprise, not, not our health care enterprise, uh, came from the state. And now that uh, is totally flipped. And, and we get about $600 million from tuition. Yep. Uh, and, and we, too, try to cushion those uh, tuition increases 
through a variety of means to, to raise financial aid in the form of grants and scholarships that students don't pay back. It's certainly uh, the impression out there that we have crushing debt amongst our recent graduates. Could you give us a picture of what debt sure. looks like? Sure. I, I, the, the debt, I'm glad you asked that because I, I think it's very important for everybody to understand um, what the what the pattern of student debt really uh, really looks like as you read these horror stories of, as you say, crushing debt. So here's a story at the University of, of Minnesota. Um, I won't do the question and, and answer. I'll just tell you that 44% of our undergraduate students graduate debt free. 44% have no debt, either student debt or parent debt. Now, it is possible, I have to say, that, and we don't think that we have graduates of the University of Minnesota who are dumb enough to do this, but they could have gotten debt somewhere else and paid more for it. We don't think they did. 44% debt free. And then uh, there's a, you know, a distribution of debt on, uh, on students. If you have debt, if you're one of the 56% of the students who have debt, its average is about $26,000. And that's $1,500 less than it was four years ago. So we've leaned into that with grant programs uh, and, and really with a focus on efficiency and graduating in four years uh, or less. If you really want to rack up debt, I tell students, then come back and pay me for year five or year six, because that's where you really see debt start to, to bump. So 25000 $26,000. Then you ask, okay, but I read in the paper about some kid who graduated with more than $100,000 in debt as an undergraduate. And I said to myself, okay, let's find that out. So um, year before last is this data. We graduated 7,465 undergraduates. Six of those people had debt of more than $100,000. Six out of 7,000. So then you ask the question of how can you generate more than $100,000 debt. The total cost of attendance at the University of Minnesota, tuition plus room and board plus incidentals, is right at $25,000. So if you're here for four years, you've spent $100,000 for that degree. So if you didn't work or have any other money, you finance the entire thing, you still can't have, a, have over $100,000 in debt. So let's look at these six students. One of them was here six years got two degrees and three minors. Bless his heart. Really bless his heart. You know, you want to do that with your life? I, no, it's not on me. That's a decision that this young person has made. Similar for the other five. Long periods of time, multiple degrees, heavily student debt finance. Now, I don't think that's a particularly good life choice, but it's one that they made. If you look at the mainstream young person graduating in four years, almost half of them debt free, if you do have debt, $25,000, you know, people get angry when I say, well, that's what you pay for a car. But that $25,000 investment in a degree that's going to guarantee you a million dollars more in lifetime earnings is a pretty good investment in yourself. Well, we have similar numbers that we shared with our board of trustees yesterday. Uh, the, the most recent cohort graduated from the University of Kentucky, 50% are debt free. Uh, the average debt amongst those who, who uh, incurred it was uh, $30,000. Unfortunately, ours has increased mm -hmm. over the last few years. We, too, shared with our Board of Trustees the distribution of that debt, and there are a few in that tail uh, of that magnitude. But when you look carefully at those, sometimes you find uh, that it wasn't a foolish decision. Sometimes they are. And as you noted, your lifetime earnings are increased, and, and I tell people it's the greatest inoculation in the volatility that you can find in an economy. During the Great Recession, those without a college degree found the unemployment rates going from 5 to 10 percent. If you had a college degree, they increased unemployment rates, but from only uh, to 4.5 percent from 2 percent. So it's still a great value, yeah. uh, but we have to remain very conscious about access and affordability. No, that's, uh, those are the, the, the mantra, those two words are our mantra here to access and affordability. We want to be accessible to every qualified Minnesota student, and we want them to be able to pay to be here. And uh, 
we work hard on that. And we've got a great partnership with our, our state legislature. Our governor has been a rock star in terms of, of helping us maintain that affordability. Uh, but we're in a business uh, with increasing costs, and we're in a business where uh, giving an hour lecture still takes an hour. And there's not a lot of technology shortcuts that help you uh, to help you make that any different. But uh, I'm proud of what we do, and I know you're proud of what you do in Kentucky. So maybe if we we'll take a flip it and uh, give uh, President Kaler a break and uh, give him a chance to ask a question or two of President Capaluto. And then I'd ask the audience if you'll take a moment while they're doing that and think of questions. We're going to give you a chance to ask the two presidents some questions here in just a few minutes. Well, since we uh, we share the, the uh, stage at the NCAA, uh, maybe it'd be interesting for you to give your perspective on uh, where we are in high-profile uh, college athletics. Uh, we're in the same boat. You were kind enough to mention uh, our navigation of a, a pretty challenging uh, uh, athlete behavior uh, issue around a potential boycott of a bowl game. But uh, where do you see uh, where do you see this going? Sure, I. Uh, I've been at the University of Kentucky now six years. I think it's, um, we're most fortunate when you look at the entire landscape and the, the budget we can enjoy at the University of Kentucky uh, is one that has allowed us to do a variety of things. First, 500 student athletes that are on scholarship. This year, uh, we opened a new academic science building. It was a $112 million facility. I said we had to do all of our construction uh, through other means. We had $2.2 billion of construction in the last five years, and only about 6% of that came from the state. So we relied on donors, and our first donor for that academic science building was UK Athletics to the tune of $65 million. So uh, we're fortunate. Uh, we're a little atypical. You know some of those institutions who are not in the Autonomy Five conferences that, that we enjoy have steeper financial challenges. <clears throat> so I think uh, you have disparities there that, that uh, create different incentives and, uh, dis and disincentives. I'm pleased that the NCAA uh, has restructured how we distribute which is the lion's share of their revenue comes from the contract associated with uh, March Madness. Mm -hmm. At, uh, several billion dollars there. And we restructured that this year to distribute the dollars more in alignment with the academic achievement of the institutions. We think that's consistent with our values. And so I think we're going to have to continue to take uh, those types of steps. Also, uh, Eric knows when, when we have our meetings, uh, he, he mentioned lawyers earlier, and believe me, I appreciate lawyers. I talk to one almost every day now. Uh, and they're valuable, and it's not just for legal advice. I, I think it's a wonderful discipline that provides me advice on management. Uh, but you know when you sit in uh, those meetings and we close with an update, we live in a very litigious society, and I think we're going to face more and more of that on the horizon. Uh, we, we just uh, reached a settlement on, uh, you know, to make a long story short, uh, Eric mentioned the cost of attendance. The NCAA used to limit scholarships across all institutions to largely room and board tuition. Uh, we wanted to move to pay that difference in cost of attendance. Those monies, we didn't do that for a while. There was a class action suit. We reached a settlement of over $200 million. I think we're going to have more of those kinds of things. We have concussions uh, emerging on the horizon. Health and well-being of our students is uh, at the forefront of everything we're doing now. But uh, I think we're going to face more of those challenges. No, I, I think you're right, and I think it uh, will be interesting to see because I, I think it's well known that the, the SEC and the Big Ten have differentiated themselves from other conferences in terms of uh, the, the revenue we receive from, uh, from media. Uh, and that's going to be a different, a, a different conversation, but I, I think the existential threat to, uh, to college athletics as it currently is organized uh, is these, uh, are these legal challenges, and um, it will be interesting. 
Well, since I recently returned from our SEC President's meeting, uh, I don't know if you've had an opportunity to look at recent data, but something else that's fascinating to watch is we launched what we think is the most successful, what was called back then, cable network, our SEC network. Uh, but we're now living in a generation of uh, cord cutters and never cords yep. that are accessing information digitally. And we learn from our ESPN uh, partner. Uh, this is a generation that is more accustomed to not paying for news. They, they don't get it the traditional ways. And they're starting to think that way about sports. And uh, that, too, is something to be concerned. You see the number of cable subscribers going in this direction. Uh, content is still keen. We have still maintained our numbers, but they are accessing it through Hulu and YouTube and a variety of other means. Yeah, it is an interesting world. We just had our Big Ten presidents and chancellors meetings uh, at an office building near O'Hare. Where was your meeting? Uh, we, we meet in Destin, Florida. <laughs> I bet it was less expensive than that. <laughs> I'm sure it was. I'm sure it was. Is there a question for us up there? Uh, yeah, so we've got a, a, a question up to the Slido. Uh, and it is, what do you see as your biggest challenge with the new federal administration? I think we probably both, both can answer that. Eli, you want to go first? Uh, I think we talked about some of this. Uh, before, I think first is uh, the budget and the willingness uh, and the, I, think, I hope we don't move into some dysfunction where we end up having really no budget and all these continuing resolutions because it is very difficult to have an enterprise as large as ours and, and not have some certainty in your budget. Yep. Uh, to be able to plan. Um, we can turn quickly, but when you're making major investments, on our campus we partnered with the state. Uh, we have a $275 million research building coming online. They're paying for half of it. We're going to pay for the other half. But uncertainty about the opportunities to go out and effectively compete for those research dollars, get the overhead to pay for the building, recruit those new research teams and all, just can put a chill. Yep. Yeah, and um, I would completely agree with that. The uncertainty financially is a challenge. Uh, I'm also uh, concerned about uncertainty in the regulatory uh, space. Um, you all know Title IX uh, creates equal opportunities for, for women and men. It's normally applied, most commonly applied uh, in, in athletics, but it's broader than that. Uh, and, you know, it's, in, it's enforced or guided by so-called dear colleague letters from the, from the Department of Education uh, around uh, particularly uh, campus guidelines with respect to how we handle uh, reports of sexual assault and sexual harassment. Uh, and those guidelines could change. And I think if the, that guideline pulls back, it leaves universities who want the status quo, which who want to be vigilant and engaged and, and, and um, uh, really strong about preventing harassment and assault, uh, legally vulnerable without that, that, uh, that regulation, that could change. Uh, there are a variety of other regulations in the education department that provide, for example, uh, funding uh, for the support of, and study of languages that are deemed critical to, uh, to national uh, security, and there's some conversation about that funding uh, going away. Uh, a lot of, of issues around health and safety, around how we conduct research, how we manage uh, the use of human subjects in, in research, of just a broad landscape uh, that could start to change, and that's going to cause ripples and, and costs as we as we adapt to new uh, to new realities. So uh, I'm worried. Uh, I'm just worried. I, sh I share your worry. So we have a second question. Uh, how many of your Fortune 500 companies were spun out of the U? Um, that's a great question. I mean, I will count Medtronics as a university startup. Um, I can't really count 3M, although the person who invented the post-it note, his name's Art Fry, 1956 chemical engineering graduate of the University of Minnesota. Um, 
I'm not sure I'm going to think of another one off the top uh, of my head. Uh, this is, I'm sure will. Otherwise, there we go. What are your thoughts on paying student athletes, both <laughs> presidents? Well, I'll go first, Eli. Uh, uh, I, uh, <laughs> I feel strongly in the, uh, in the traditional uh, student athlete model that we use now. I think our student athletes get a tremendous uh, deal. Uh, they get, uh, if they're, they're going to, uh, to go pro, they get tremendous national exposure. They get uh, first rate coaching. They get terrific uh, nutrition. Uh, they get a free college degree, no student debt. Uh, they, get, uh, they get exposure uh, and they get uh, a chance to grow and mature uh, as an athlete. Uh, that's the positive uh, of the model. Uh, the other side of it is the negatives to a model in which you pay student athletes. So if you pay student athletes, uh, then there is less money uh, available for support of your athletic program, which means con consequently you will offer fewer sports. Uh, we have 750 student athletes. Uh, if you start paying uh, them, uh, then that support of all of the, the non-revenue sports, so we make money on football, men's basketball, uh, a little bit on, um, on hockey. Uh, the support of the other 22 sports we offer uh, will go away, so there'll be fewer uh, competition opportunities in our Olympic sports. And then if you start to kind of unwind what paying athletes actually looks like, uh, it gets very complicated very quickly. For example, you're now paying an athlete. Who do you pay? Do you pay everybody? Do you pay the stars more than you pay the, the third stringers? Very complicated. You pay tax. You're going to need insurance. I'm not sure that you don't pay for your medical care. It just is a fundamental change of what college athletes, athletics looks like. And I think if you get that to its logical conclusion, what that means is that institutions who want to pay athletes probably um, license their logo uh, to a semi-pro organization. And if it's in the sport of football, it begins to look a lot like minor league baseball, but they're paying with college uh, names. I don't think the Big Ten will do that. I think if the, the, the idea is that you are allowed to pay student athletes, I don't, I don't think we'll do that. I think there's still a lot of value in fans who want to watch student athletes playing traditional rivalries with other traditional universities. I agree with you that one of the uh, pending court cases, though, is the pay market rate. So imagine yeah. how complicated that gets. At the University of Kentucky, uh, we sponsor 22 sports. Uh, two of them have a net positive revenue. That is football and basketball, and this is always a surprise to a lot of people. I'm going to repeat it again. The net revenues from football are twice that of basketball at the University of Kentucky. So that's how significant it is, but Eric is exactly right. Without the really positive revenues from those two, we, we couldn't fund the other 20. And it's, 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 I mean, it's a different reality, right? I mean, change happens, and so that change could happen. But I'm not sure, well, I don't think there will ever be a requirement that you have to pay student athletes. And I believe a large number of institutions are going to say, no, we're not, we're not going to do that. Are you going to take a haircut on your, on your uh, media uh, revenues? Probably, but, you know, people still want to see Michigan play Ohio State, they want to see Minnesota play Wisconsin, they want to see Kentucky play Louisville. So I, I get to where we have time for one more question, so I'm going to use NC's privilege and choose one. And uh, I like the second question. If you had to pick only one thing, what, w what, would, you, what would you ask community business leaders to do to help the universities most? Since we're a Commerce Lexington and uh, community business, so each president, what, what's the one thing you would ask business leaders to do to help the university most? Uh, well, I, I always appreciate the advocacy, but it's difficult for me to ask, answer that question because my first response is, what should we be doing in service to you? Um, we've got to prepare that talent. We've got to make sure our educational pro programs align with what you see uh, as the competency and skill set for your next generation of employees. And I think we have uh, even greater responsibilities today to, to make sure that alignment uh, exists. Uh, but I'll go back to this advocacy. Uh, we, 
I think we live in an environment in our state where uh, economic vitality is, is, is critical. I think uh, our legislative uh, disposition and posture at, the, at both legislative and executive branch uh, listens to business and uh, your clear voices in support of what we're doing would be, uh, and it's been there, but to continue it is vital to our future. Yeah, I would, would agree with both sides of that. You should hold us accountable for delivering on the mission that, uh, that we hold dear, which is educating the next generation of, of the workforce and creating the, the inventions and the ideas that, that fuel uh, business and fuel the economy. Uh, we all compete on a world landscape uh, for talent. And creative people, people with talent, want to be associated with other creative people and people with talent. And those are found in a higher concentration at research universities uh, than they are most other places. So the investment in that university is, is I think, critical. Now, you'd expect me to say that as a, as a university president. And, and if you believe that, the thing you, you need to do uh, is advocate uh, for that, that support from, uh, from state legislators uh, so that we don't have to put increasingly that burden on families uh, and their students, in particular on families and students from uh, diverse backgrounds, uh, first-generation students, students who represent the changing demographic uh, in the United States, in, in Kentucky and in Minnesota. Uh, that investment is absolutely critical uh, for the healthy economy of the future for this, for this country. I, I don't think there's a lot that's more critical than that, but there are a lot of loud voices uh, who will tell you uh, that, yeah, something else is important. Is K through 12 education really important? Yeah, it is. Is good affordable health care really important for everybody? Yeah, it is. But an educated, creative, creating, uh, university that's creating opportunities is essential to drive the economy that supports those other two elements. I want to mention one thing to you and see if you've had a similar experience. Uh, we had a reception last year for all those individuals who successfully filed a patent. Hmm. It was a great experience. First time we'd ever done that. Uh, and uh, what was striking about that uh, group of, you know, to, there were hundreds of people that filed these things. You know, five of them may have filed one. Uh, but as I looked through that group, thinking about that diverse talent you bring to a campus, I could easily estimate that two-thirds of those individuals who are on our faculty were foreign-born, yeah. uh, who come to this country uh, because of an entrepreneurial, sort of uh, free and open society to discover and create. And has that been a similar experience? Here? Absolutely. And uh, you know, you look at the diversity of, uh, of our graduate programs in, in science and engineering, uh, a lot of, of international students who come to the United States because this is the best place in the world to do that. And, um, you know, then we could talk about immigration policy. I think if you get a PhD in a STEM field, you ought to staple a green card to it and stay in the United States, but not everybody agrees with me. Okay, uh, can we give the presidents a, a hand of applause for a great Thank you.